how to improve on classical guitar. Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm going to go ahead and start off with a couple questions that were sent in advance. And if you'll go ahead and drop questions in the chat as you have them, uh, then I'll be able to uh, check there as well and answer questions as they come in. So uh, please don't hesitate uh, to drop questions in the chat as we're going. And I look forward to that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up uh, the chat on my phone so I'm ready to respond to questions uh, as they come in the chat. Uh, so one of the questions that came in advance uh, was about planting with the right hand. Uh, so planting with the right hand is just getting the finger on the string in advance before plucking and why would you do that? Uh, you know it would seem like you just sort of swing the finger at the string but if you get used to preparing a little in advance it creates a greater security uh, when you pluck. Uh, so I would advocate for planting and placing the finger on the string in advance. Uh, so how do you plant? Well, uh, for example, if you're playing a PIMA arpeggio, as thumb plays, I would plant the index and middle and ring fingers as a group on the strings and then pluck each one. Uh, if you're doing a descending arpeggio from trebles to basses, I would plant uh, what I call sequentially. So as ring plays, M plants, M plays, I plants, I plays, P plants. But the ascending from bass to trebles, uh, I would plant as a group when possible. So again, thumb plays and IMA plants on the string. So again, by planting on the string, uh, you will get a better tone. Uh, you'll be kind of more secure in the way that you're plucking. Now, another of the questions that I got in advance was about teaching young kids the classical guitar. Um, you know, is there a minimum age uh, to start a young child on classical guitar? And I don't think there necessarily is a minimum age. It depends how the teacher approaches things. Uh, if you use a traditional approach of working from a method book and uh, teaching one string at a time and that sort of thing, then I'd say the minimum age for teaching guitar to a kid might be around seven years old. Uh, but if a teacher uses more of the Suzuki approach where there's more rote learning and learning by ear, then even a very young child, even a three-year-old or four-year-old could learn the guitar using something like the Suzuki approach. So as far as a young child learning guitar, I would say, again, traditional approach, maybe starting at seven, Suzuki approach, maybe even starting at three. Another question about the young person uh, learning guitar, do they need a smaller size instrument or can they use a standard size guitar? And I would say, you know, if they're maybe a five to eight year old, it might be good to think about a half size guitar. If they're like eight to 11, you might wanna think about a three quarter. If they're 12 and older, uh, then a full size guitar is probably fine. Uh, but you know, you'll need to think about that individual child's hand size. So you might wanna just have them try out a guitar and see uh, how the guitar uh, fits their hands. Uh, another question that I received in advance uh, was, uh, what did Segovia think of the internet? And I think that Segovia thought the internet was a miniature orchestra. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't know what Segovia would have thought of the internet, uh, but I do think uh, that Segovia would have used the internet to spread his music. So Segovia was all about spreading the classical guitar and advancing the classical guitar in any way he could have. So I think if he would have had um, you know, access to the internet, I think Segovia would have used it. So I know that person was joking a little when they said that, but just thought I'd go ahead and respond to that. Um, I see a question in the chat. If, uh, if I've taught guitar lessons uh, to a young person, what's the youngest person I've ever taught? I think the youngest student I ever taught was six. And um, so for me personally, uh, starting around six or seven uh, felt right. And again, I don't personally use the Suzuki method. And I know some teachers who are great that use that. So again, I think if you use that more sort of um, rote or by ear methodology, then I think you can teach a younger person. But for me personally, a six-year-old was the youngest person that I've taught. Uh, how do you practice chords uh, with a metronome uh, is another question that I see there in the chat. So good question. In general, when I'm practicing with the metronome, I'm going to want to practice slowly and not, um, not go faster than I'm comfortable with. So depends, I suppose, when you say practice chords in the classical context, usually we're plucking the chords uh, with the right hand fingers. You know, of course, you could also strum you know, with a pick uh, chords or whatever. But however you're playing the chords, uh, I think the important thing is not to set the metronome faster than you're comfortable. 
Um, you know, what I see some people do is they'll set the metronome at 100, let's say, and they can't stay with it. And they say, you know, I just can't practice with the metronome because the metronome is too fast for me. Well, what I would say for that is you can set the metronome um, to click very slowly. Uh, so I'll go ahead and I use a metronome app on my phone and so you can download a metronome on your phone. But I'll go ahead and pull up my metronome app for a second. So, you know, let's say that I'm playing chords with the metronome and um, I'm just going to play some block chords. And I find, you know, so that was 100. Let's say that I find that playing at 100 is a little difficult. So what I'll do then is I'll just slow the metronome down. Uh, so if, you know, again, if you find a particular passage too difficult, so now maybe I have it at 50. And it's much easier to stay with the metronome at the slower tempo. Now, in an extreme case, sometimes with beginners, uh, they go as slow as their metronome will go. Now, this metronome app will go all the way down to 10 uh, beats per minute. You know, so that's very, very slow. So it's almost even hard to keep up if you practice that slowly. And then, you know, it's kind of like, how do I keep up? Well, in that case, what you might want to do is maybe set the metronome at something like 40 and then only play on every fourth click if you really need to play at quarter equals 10, let's say. So two, three, four, play your next chord and maybe play on the beat would be good. Three, four, one, two, three, four, you know. And so I would say playing slowly with the metronome and uh, you know just finding the tempo that works for you where you can play accurately is a good way to go. Uh, so good questions. So feel free to keep dropping questions in the chat uh, and I'll kind of mix in the questions in the chat and the ones I received in advance. Uh, so another question I got that I thought was a really good one was the basic things that I look at when I learn a new piece. Um, so you know, in other words, do you learn the whole piece at once? Uh, do you start by just learning the notes only and then come back and learn the dynamics later? Uh, do you go measure by measure, etc.? cetera? Uh, so I wanna talk about that just a little bit. And let's say that I'm learning Etude Number no. 2 by Carcassi uh, from the Opus 60. Uh, well, uh, whatever I'm learning, uh, I would approach it probably in a similar way, but I'm gonna go ahead and use this piece, uh, Carcassi Etude 2, as an example. Um, the first stage of learning that I use is what I call mapping. Uh, then I move to what I call learning. And then from there, I move uh, to polishing and then memorizing if I choose to memorize and then ultimately performing. And so um, let me just talk through for a moment. And I see another question in the chat. I'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, let me just sort of walk through how I might approach Carcassi number two with five stages of learning. So again, my first stage of mapping, I'm just uh, clarifying what are the fingerings. So in other words, what are my right hand fingerings? What are my left hand fingerings? And so the first few measures, uh, and in fact, most of the piece, the right hand fingering is the same. It's P-I-M-A-M-I-M-I. -M -I -M -I. So I would get clear on that. I would map out, okay, that's the right hand fingering I'm gonna use. P-I-M-A-M-I-M-I. -M -I -M -I. And then for the left hand, with a piece like Carcassi II, these kind of repetitive arpeggios, I might just block out the chords. Okay, my left hand's on these notes, A and C, then it's on B, D, and G sharp, then it's on C, E, and A, then it's on E, G sharp, and B, it's on E, A, and C, it's on D, D, F, and B, and then uh, B, E, and G sharp, and then and G sharp down here. So in other words, I'm blocking out, where's my left hand go? And once I'm clear where both my hands are gonna go, that's what I call technical mapping. Now, I like to go ahead and do expressive mapping, thinking about the dynamics even early on in learning a piece. Uh, so if I'm learning this piece for the first time, I'm gonna think about, do I wanna have a little crescendo as the melody goes up and a decrescendo as the melody comes down? And that's what I call expressive mapping. Uh, so I might go ahead and try to play at a slow tempo even with some of that dynamic shaping.
And so once I sort of know this is the technical mapping, this is what I want to do with my hands, and this is the expressive mapping, this is what I want to do with dynamics, that's the mapping stage. And as far as like how much of the piece do you do at once, do you do it measure by measure or whatever, I typically will take about four measures at a time. So I'm going to do four measures and map them, and then the next four measures and map them until the whole piece is mapped. And again, mapped, I mean I know what fingers I want to use, I know what dynamics I want to use. Then I'm going to move to the next stage called learning. So learning means that I want to actually um, get confident in playing those fingerings and those dynamics. Uh, so I'm going to get more comfortable with implementing what I've initially learned. And obviously I had a little pause on the one shift. Um, and so if you have something like that, then hey, I want to go back. I want to see, you know, why did, why did I have that pause there? Uh, maybe I was unclear on the shift I was doing. And just make sure I've got that. In this instance, I've got a guide finger on the second string. So that's something useful I can refer to um, in that learning stage. Once I have the learning stage down, in other words, I've mastered the technical and expressive aspects, uh, then I'd move to what I call the polishing stage, where I'm just making some little tweaks and just continuing to make it better. Um, then from there, if I want to memorize, I'll memorize. And I will often memorize from the end backwards. So again, I might go four measures at a time, but I might start with the last four measures. And that's something I got from David Russell. I played for him in a master class years ago, and he said that he always memorizes from the end, so he's more confident in where he's going. Feels like he's driving out of the fog, not driving into the fog. And so that's a way I've memorized a lot of pieces from the end backwards. Uh, again, usually like four measures at a time. Then the last stage of a piece is performing. So if I'm intending to perform in front of an audience, then I actually take the piece to the audience once I have moved through the mapping, learning, um, the polishing, the memorizing. Uh, then I go and share that piece with an audience. So hopefully that helps on the process of learning a piece. Um, I'm going to go back to the chat here. Uh, what do you say to a student whom you know has not practiced at all during the week between lessons? Uh, he or she may have lost interest. Well, this is a tricky one uh, because you can really discourage a student sometimes by being too harsh. I've known teachers before that would say to a student who didn't practice, you just need to leave. Don't even waste my time. Uh, I'm not going to sit with you if you didn't take the time to practice. And so either that teacher just tells the student just to completely leave or they tell them to go in another room and practice during the lesson time, uh, but the teacher's just like, go away. Uh, you're wasting my time. I've never been comfortable doing that when I'm teaching. To me, that just seems a little overly harsh. I can see the rationale. You're trying to teach the student a lesson about the importance of practice, but that's not my preferred approach. Uh, what I'll typically do is if it's a student that normally has practiced and maybe they just had an off week, um, you know, I'm going to be very encouraging about that. Hey, you know, everybody has a week when they don't get to practice as much as normal. And I'll just try to encourage them in lesson. Hey, let's go ahead and treat this lesson as a practice session. Let's go ahead and practice through this. You know, yeah, I realize maybe you didn't learn what you were supposed to learn. Let's go ahead and work on learning it right now. I'm going to show you the approach I would use to learn the piece, you know, sort of like what I was talking about a couple minutes ago, uh, the process I use. So I would just kind of walk the student through, hey, let's learn this passage together here in lesson. And let's see if we can set you up for success this coming week uh, of how you can play this. Uh, if I notice, though, that it's two or three weeks in a row, the student just isn't practicing, then the second or third week, I'm going to start asking questions. Do you not like the music that we're learning? Um, you know, what do you really want to be learning? Because sometimes it's a disconnect between what the student wants to learn and what you're teaching. Uh, so in other words, you know, maybe you're teaching them this dry, boring exercise, and there's a particular piece of music that they really want to learn. And for me, even though I'm primarily a classical teacher, I will certainly teach the student rock songs and pop songs. You know, if they're really wanting to learn something specific, uh, I want to kind of feed their interest. And I view teaching kind of as a two-way street. There are certainly things I want the student to learn, techniques I think are important for them, knowledge I think is important for them to have. But at the same time, I want to be aware of what the student wants to learn. And if there's certain songs they want to learn, uh, then I will definitely, uh, you know, key in on that and say, hey, yeah, let's learn this song that you want to learn. Uh, now, 
On uh, the other hand, let's say we get to lesson four or five and they're still not practicing. And yeah, they said they really wanted to learn this rock song and we tried to help them learn it and they still aren't practicing. Then I might have a hard conversation. You know, are you sure you want to learn the guitar at this point in time? And if it's a child, you know, I might ask their parent, you know, I'm not sure if Johnny wants to learn to play the instrument. And, you know, when I used to teach a lot of uh, young kids, and I don't teach young kids so much these days, but when I used to teach a lot of young kids, uh, sometimes I'd have that conversation with the parent and the parent would just say, look, I just want Johnny to have the experience of taking guitar lessons. I don't really care if they practice. Well, if the parent doesn't care if they practice, then that's often part of the reason the kid doesn't practice. And so my preference would be that the parent would say, hey, you know, what? I'm going to check in with Johnny and I'll try to make sure that he practices some this week. That would be my preference. But again, some parents are going to say, hey, I just want the kid in lessons. I don't care if they practice. And if that's the case, um, you know, obviously you can keep teaching them. And part of this, you know, depends on um, kind of your attitude as a teacher. Again, some teachers are like, hey, I don't want to spend my time with a student like that. Other teachers will say, hey, I guess as long as they pay me, I'll go ahead and do this. Uh, but from my standpoint, I would always rather err on the side of giving the student the benefit of the doubt, trying to work with them. When I used to work with a lot of kids, I did work with some kids who didn't practice much. And I would just try to encourage them. I'd try to find something to catch their interest to motivate them. Another uh, question I see in the chat, how can I find notation after the fifth fret, like before the fifth fret? I can understand, but after that, I don't understand. So um, I think what you're saying is, you know, if you're playing down here, uh, a lot of method books very clearly explain, you know, here's uh, where this note is on the staff uh, and here's where the note is on the guitar. And so it's pretty easy to kind of make that correlation of finding the notes uh, on the guitar from sheet music. But you're saying, you know, hey, if you get up to the fifth fret or higher on the neck, uh, higher in pitch, then how do you know what those notes are? Well, the tricky thing with the guitar is every note can be found a lot of different places. So take like the E on the first string, the treble E. That E can be found on the fifth fret of the second string, and then the ninth fret of uh, the third string, it can be found on the 14th fret of uh, the fifth string, and then the 19th fret of, uh, sorry, what did I say? The 14th fret of the fourth string, the 19th fret of the fifth string, and then the 24th fret harmonic of the sixth string. So that single E note would be on one spot in the staff, like if it's on a treble clef, that E is notated in the top space of the treble clef, but that E can be found in all these different places. So, so a lot of times uh, guitarists uh, get made fun of for not being able to read sheet music, for not being able to read staff notation. And I think sometimes we get a little lazy in our sight reading, but also I think we have a valid reason that sometimes uh, some of us struggle with note reading because um, every note on the guitar can be found in multiple places, except for the very low bass notes. Uh, you know, that can only be found in one place, but most of the notes on the guitar can be found in more than one place. And so that just makes it tricky. So in other words, if you're looking at staff notation and you see an E in the top space of the treble clef, you could also play that note here on the fifth fret of the second string or here on the ninth fret of the third string. And so that's just something that you have to learn is what is that relationship between the notation and where this is. Uh, one of the best things I would say is to learn the distance in frets between the strings. So in other words, if you think about that old fifth fret way of tuning the guitar, which I don't love as a tuning method, I don't love it as a tuning method because you can often compound error. You know, if you tune one of the strings wrong, then all the rest of the strings are out of tune then. Uh, so I don't love it as a tuning method, but it is a good way to learn the relationships between the strings. So in other words, if you are tuning um, the first string using the fifth fret on the second string, then what that means is those two things are the same note. You know, the open first string and the fifth string on the second fret are the same note. And so what that means is if I want to find that F on the second string, then it means I go five frets higher. So if the F is on the first fret, I go up to the sixth fret. Then the G, that's on the third fret, I go five frets higher, that's the eighth fret. Um, now, most of the pairs of strings are five frets apart, and so you just find it five frets higher on the next lower string. The difference is between the second and third, it's a difference of four frets. So if you're looking for this C, you go four frets higher. It's on the first fret, so it's gonna be on the fifth fret. This D is four frets higher, so it's on the third, then you find it on the seventh. So I hope that helps. Uh, but basically what I'm saying is, if you know where that note is 
on, you know, let's say the first string, then uh, you can find it five frets higher on the second string, for example. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Thanks for that question. So again, drop questions in the chat as you have them. And I'm going to also kind of bounce back and forth between the chat and questions that were um, offered in advance. So another question that was offered in advance was uh, if a person has reached a proficiency level of grade eight on the guitar, would there be lessons involving theory at that point? Now, uh, let me unpack that for a second. When you say learning at grade eight, uh, you're implying graded repertoire. And I live in the United States. And one of the things I'll say is here in the United States, not all teachers use graded repertoire. It's not a, as, as big a focus for teachers in the United States as it is in some other countries. Um, I don't know all the reasons that that's the case, but just that's, that's how it is. So uh, when I think about graded repertoire, I think about the Canadian system. Um, I'm most familiar with the Canadian graded repertoire from Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. And so um, I'll, I'll talk in that system, but some of the European systems that do graded repertoire are similar as well. Uh, so thinking about um, graded repertoire and are there theory lessons. Uh, if you go to the Royal Conservatory graded repertoire, there are actually theory lessons that start from level one and they start doing theory exams at level five. Uh, so certainly if you're using those graded repertoire systems, whether you know London or, uh, or the Royal Conservatory in Toronto, Canada, or another uh, graded repertoire system, there typically are theory lessons that go with each grade. And I think you know, helping students to have theory knowledge is a great thing. Now, you know, one of the uh, things to realize is that some students are not super motivated in theory. And so you have to find ways to show them the importance, uh, you know, that theory is really a way of understanding how music works and how it's put together. Uh, sometimes helping a student to improvise and understand how to use scales and chords to improvise is a way to help them to understand the importance of theory. But sometimes just like, hey, let's go through this piece and analyze what these chords are. Um, it's not always as motivational. So you got to find ways to motivate students, but certainly they can learn theory throughout. Uh, this same uh, question sort of asked, uh, are there formal theory exams uh, at the higher levels? And yeah, again, from level five up in the Royal Conservatory method, there are formal theory exams. Um, they also ask, are there theory and performance exams to enter most universities' classical guitar music programs? And yes, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of university programs will have a music theory entrance exam. It's not always something that keeps you from getting in, but it will kind of place the student in uh, their music theory classes, you know, to help the professors to know what music theory class the student needs to take. Uh, so good question. I'm going to go back to the chat and I see uh, where do I have to put the thumb? And so I'm assuming you're talking about the left hand thumb. Obviously in the right hand we pluck with the thumb. So I'm guessing that this question is about the left hand thumb. And so obviously the left hand thumb is going to be behind the neck. But one of the things I'll say is, um, you know, you do want to have the left hand thumb generally kind of between the first and second fingers. And so if I'm playing with my, you know, index and, and uh, middle fingers on the first two frets, then I'm going to want to have the thumb kind of between those two fingers. So if I show you the back of the neck, uh, my thumb is just kind of between those two fingers. And I want the tip of the thumb to be sort of close to where the tips of my fingers are. So let's say if the tips of my fingers are over by the sixth string, I want the tip of my thumb to be over by the sixth string. If um, you know, I'm playing over on the first string, I want the tip of my thumb to be over closer to the first string. So basically, I think of the thumb as like operating like a pair of pliers with the fingers. So in other words, I'm grasping the neck. And so I want to have the, the thumb supporting the fingers. You know, classical teachers usually say, hey, don't put the thumb up like this. You'll see this a lot of times with folk guitarists. They'll have the thumb up over the neck. And there are good reasons to do that. You know, if you're playing a chord where you want to fret the chord with your thumb, then you can do that. It's easier to do on a steel string guitar where you have a narrower neck. You can reach around and fret a note with the thumb. Uh, but what I always say is, uh, I, I try not to be dogmatic, like, hey, you can never put the thumb up here, because some classical teachers never put the thumb up here. Well. You know, again, if I were going to fret a note with it, that'd be fine. But in general, I would say I want that pair of pliers. I want the thumb supporting the other fingers. So I want the thumb, again, sort of between the first and second fingers and roughly where the fingertips are. And of course, if you're playing a chord, uh, maybe just 
put the tip of the thumb in kind of the middle of the neck supporting the cord. So hopefully that helps as far as where you put the thumb. Um, I see another uh, question here. Lately, people seem to be taking lessons online. What equipment or programs are necessary to take lessons online? Web camera, mic, Zoom application, large screen computer. It's a good question. And so, yeah, a lot of teachers are doing lessons through Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Skype or FaceTime or any of these video conferencing programs. And so as far as what uh, computer program you need, again, um, there's a lot of those that you can have access to, you know, Zoom, Teams, uh, etc., that you can potentially get access to for free. And so there's no cost uh, to a program like that. Um, as far as web camera or, or uh, microphone or things like that, yeah, it does help if you have a better web camera. Uh, you know, the one that's built into your computer sometimes is not the highest quality. So sometimes it's nice to have an external uh, webcam. Uh, also nice to have an external mic. I have a USB mic I'm using here. It's a Samson CO1U Pro. And when I teach lessons online, um, you know, I do use the, uh, the Samson CO1U Pro USB mic because I find that gets a little better sound. Um, you know, just like when I'm doing my live stream, I use this mic. I also use it when I'm teaching an online lesson through Zoom or Microsoft Teams. As far as a large screen computer, I don't really find that that's essential, uh, but I do have a separate larger monitor and I do use that sometimes. But a lot of times when I'm teaching um, you know, a, a lesson online, I don't necessarily uh, use my big screen uh, for the lesson. Uh, to me, just a, even a laptop screen is fine for an online lesson. So good questions. I see another question in the chat. Uh, how to touch right hand to rondo, wrist angle, angle of finger. So good question. Well, let's start off with what I would call the default right hand position. And so that is when you have uh, your hand uh, where the index, middle, and ring are on the treble strings and the thumb is on the bases. Uh, typically, when I have kind of my default right hand position for classical guitar, uh, then I'm going to be plucking at a bit of an angle to the strings. Um, so I'm going to want to keep my right wrist aligned kind of in the mid range of its movement and I'm going to want to have uh, the fingers will actually be plucking at an angle uh, to the treble strings. Uh, there's two reasons for this. Uh, one is, again, I just want a comfortable wrist position. I don't want a big bend of my wrist as kind of my default wrist position. I want to have my wrist in the mid range of its movement. Um, and also, I like the oblique sound when I'm playing the treble strings. So in other words, if I were to play straight on the treble string, I get a much brighter sound, which can be good for variety, but um, in general, my kind of default is I pluck more at an angle and it gets a little warmer tone. And again, you know, if I have this, uh, you know, sort of straight on attack, I have to bend my wrist uh, to the side, sort of deviate my wrist. And I don't like that from a uh, from an ergonomic standpoint. In other words, it's not that comfortable for the wrist. So I generally want to have that aligned wrist and I want to uh, just pluck it kind of an angle to the string. Part of this um, is also affected by how steep your neck angle is. I generally think of the neck as being about a 45 degree angle. And uh, so obviously, you know, depending on where, like if you have the guitar much flatter, that's gonna kind of affect things. If you have the guitar much straighter up, that would affect things. But for me, I like the neck angle about 45 degrees. Then I have my wrist fairly straight. I'm plucking kind of at an angle on the trebles. Now, if I brought my index and middle fingers down to the bases, I would do a little wrist bend and go straighter through the string to avoid kind of a scraping on the bases. But when I'm on the trebles, um, I do just the straight wrist and kind of an oblique pluck through the strings. So thanks for that question. I see another uh, question and that is about nail shape. Um, so great question. Um, and a lot of times I see things about nail shape that I don't think are that helpful. Sometimes I see advice like, hey, your nail shape should be the same as the end of your fingertip. Well, what does it really matter what is the shape of the end of your fingertip? What matters is how is the nail going to slide through the string uh, when you pluck? Uh, so in other words, you know, if you have some odd shaped uh, fingertip, I don't think that means that you necessarily need to copy the shape of the end of your fingertip uh, with your nail. I think the key is that the nail is gonna slide through the string. So for me, what I do uh, is I do basically what Scott Tennant talks about in Pumping Nylon. I create a little bit of an angle with the nail. Um, so where I'm initially going to uh, pluck the string uh, is going to be on this side of the nail and then the string is going to kind of travel up and off the ramp. So I kind of file at this ramp shape and I round the corners off because I don't want the corners to catch. 
And then I also file underneath, and then again, I round the corners off. And what I would say is that method of filing gets good results for a lot of students with a lot of different finger shapes and a lot of different nail shapes. Because yeah, fingers are different shapes, nails are different shapes, but again, I want something that's gonna glide through the strings. And I find when I file at that ramp angle and round off the corners and then file underneath the nail at a ramp angle and round off the corners, I can usually get a nail shape that's gonna glide through the string easily. So that's what I recommend, uh, kind of a rounded ramp. Uh, is the shape. So keep dropping questions in the chat if you have them. I'm going to go to another question uh, that was asked in advance and that was how to balance uh, between different strings. And you know I don't know that it's so much balancing between different strings if I you know look at this question as balancing between different fingers. Um, you know, in other words, I think sometimes there could be a tendency that a certain string may stick out more because of the way the guitar is made or because of the particular brand of strings you have or whatever. Uh, you know, maybe a certain string would sound louder than others. But in general, I think what you, what you have to think about is balancing the different fingers. So in other words, are you playing much harder with your ring finger? Are you playing much harder with your thumb? And so a great exercise for that is if you just put your thumb, index, middle, and ring all on the strings, so like thumb on the fourth string, index on the third, middle on the second, and ring on the first string, and then you just pluck that as a block chord, then what you can do is try to bring each finger out a little louder. Um, and this is, again, question is to create balance, but I would start by trying to bring each finger out louder in turn. So the easiest one to bring out louder is usually the thumb. So let's bring the thumb out. How do you bring it out? Well, by pressing the string in toward the guitar, displacing the string more, that's how you make it louder. So I would push the string down more with the thumb than with the other. Uh, so I'm actually pushing that string in toward the guitar a little more with the thumb. And you know, it takes a little trial and error sometimes to find exactly what we're looking for. So that's bringing the thumb out more. Then if I wanted to bring the ring finger out more, that's often another one that works well is bringing the ring finger out because a lot of times we're used to bringing out the treble note. Uh, the ones that are harder to bring out are the middle and index, uh, but we can do that too. And then here's index. So basically, what I'm seeking to do is get control of each of the different fingers so I can make the ring the loudest, the thumb the loudest, the index the loudest, the middle the loudest if I want. And sometimes when I'm playing, I want to bring out a particular finger. And then if I'm trying to balance the different strings and the different fingers, then I have the control to do that because I've developed control over each individual finger and I just listen and notice, oh, that string's coming out too much. And then that's how I would balance it. Uh, so that's how I would answer the question of how do you balance uh, the different strings. Uh, now I see another question in the chat. Uh, do you like Savarez strings? And yes, I do. I'm actually using Savarez strings on this guitar. Um, this guitar, I have the, um, it's the blue Corum basses and then red Alliance trebles. Savarez sells a mixed set where they sell uh, the blue, which is the high tension basses along with the red uh, normal tension Alliance uh, trebles. The Alliance trebles are a, um, a sort of composite string and so for those I like the normal tension I find the normal tension to be plenty hard enough uh, so I'm using quorum basses and alliance trebles of Savarez right now on this guitar um, you know I've used Adario in the past I've used Augustine in the past I like other brands as well uh, but uh, Savarez is the one that I've really settled on for the last number of years and those are actually my favorite currently so good question um, so if you have other questions, drop them in the chat. I'm gonna to go to another question that was sent in advance. And uh, this was about if you're playing solo guitar, do you need fingernails or can you play with no nails? And the person who wrote this question was saying, well, what about people like Carcassi and Soar who played without nails? Uh, Tariga later in his life played without nails. Uh, Miguel Yobet uh, played without nails. So, you know, there were these great players historically who played without nails. Uh, what about that? And then they also said, hey, in the modern era, we've got modern guitars and amplifiers that can play so loud, do we really need to use nails uh, to play classical guitar? And the short answer is, you can totally play classical guitar uh, without nails. Uh, what I find, you know, I do use nails to play. Uh, what I find is the advantage of using the fingernails is um, they provide a little bit more precision uh, than just plucking with the end of the fingertip. 
And they also provide an, an opportunity for sort of a brighter, clearer tone. Um, you know, some people really love the tone they get with just their fingertips, and that's fine. Um, I like combining the nail and flesh. Uh, Andre Segovia really kind of championed combining the nail and flesh. Uh, so, you know, here's a combination of nail and flesh. Now, here's just the flesh. If I use the thumb, that's the easiest one for me to get just the flesh. You know, there's not quite the clarity there as here. You know, when I use the combination of nail and flesh, there's a little more clarity with just the flesh. I find there's a little less definition of the tone there. So I like the tone better, the clarity I can get with nail, but again, I use a combination of nail and flesh to get some of the warmth of flesh in there. Um, so that's my preference. Um, also, you know, you can get a little more volume with the nails, but I understand what the person's saying. Hey, if you're gonna play with an amplifier, uh, you wouldn't need that additional volume. Uh, so, you know, I understand that point. I would also say if you're gonna do any rascato techniques, so that's striking the strings with the back of the nail, you know. You know, that you really need to have a little nail uh, to be able to do that rascato technique. So in general, I prefer nails for classical guitar, but I totally get it that some people uh, prefer not to use nails. So uh, good question. And I see another question in the chat. Um, do you recommend learning classical guitar before flamenco? Well, I think that you can learn in kind of either order with classical and flamenco. I think they're very different. Uh, you know, one of the things, because I, I learned classical for many years before I learned some flamenco, and I don't consider myself an accomplished flamenco guitarist. Um, really, you know, my main training and experience has been with classical, but I, I know some flamenco techniques. Uh, but one of the things I didn't understand initially about flamenco is that it's really a folk style. It's really, um, you know, almost like a popular music uh, of Spain. And so because it's a folk style, it's not typically notated. It's more improvisatory. And so, uh, you know, I started for a long time on classical. I'm like, hey, I'm going to go learn flamenco. Let me go find some sheet music uh, that's going to tell me exactly what to play for flamenco, kind of that classical approach of I'm going to have sheet music notation. And I found that. I mean, you can find books that have notated flamenco music, but uh, when I talk to real uh, excellent flamenco players, like I talked to Adam Del Monte and Grisha Goryachev, who are fantastic flamenco players, they said, you know, flamenco is really meant to be improvised. It's not necessarily about um, just having this written down sheet music the way we would as a classical player. So one of the things I would say, if you're interested in both classical and flamenco, just realize it's a whole different approach to do flamenco. It's going to be more improvisatory. You're learning uh, sort of these beat patterns, uh, which, you know, it's sort of like if you've ever played blues guitar, there's like the 12-bar blues, that kind of repeating pattern. Well, in flamenco, they have like the solea, and it's kind of a repeating beat pattern, and there's going to be certain chords at certain points in the solea, and then you're going to improvise between those uh, those. Uh, predictable chords. And so, uh, again, it, it's more like a, a feel of blues or folk music or popular music with more improvisation in it. Uh, but with that said, I think you can do it in either order. I mean, you can learn flamenco first or classical first, uh, but just realize that flamenco does require a very different approach uh, than classical uh, because it is more improvisatory, not so uh, notated. So good question about flamenco. Uh, another question I see is the distance between the guitar and your wrist and inner angle uh, flexion angle of your wrist of the right hand. Uh, so distance between the guitar and your wrist. Well, uh, I'm going to in general be thinking about my hand. Uh, so what I don't want to do is conform my hand to the guitar. I want to conform the guitar to my hand, so to speak. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is I want to find whatever is going to be the most ergonomic position for my wrist, the position that's going to be most comfortable for me when I'm playing. And uh, so uh, generally, I think of I want to have kind of a flat surface across the back of my arm and, and hand here. Um, so that's going to partly determine the distance between the guitar and my hand. Uh, so if I were to turn the guitar where you can kind of see, you know, hopefully you can see the distance there. That distance is partly determined by me keeping a flat surface across the top of my wrist. It's also determined by kind of the curvature of my right hand fingers. I'm going to generally be in the mid range of curvature of all my joints, you know, the, the big knuckle joint, the middle joint, the tip joint. All of those are somewhat curved uh, when I play, especially when I play free stroke. Um, so by having that sort of flat top of my wrist and having those curved fingers, that's going to determine the distance um, from the guitar. So I wouldn't start with, you know, how far is my wrist from the guitar as my first question. My first question is going to be, is my wrist in its best possible position? Are my fingers in their best possible position? 
And then that's, again, going to kind of determine how far I am from the guitar. What I will say, though, is if your wrist is down by the guitar, that really constricts fingerstyle playing. You know, a lot of pick style players, they'll kind of rest their, their hand on the bridge, you know, and they're playing with the pick. And that works fine if you're playing with a pick. But if you're trying to play fingerstyle that way, it really kind of constricts the natural movement of the hand. So, again, I want to be up away from the guitar, have that straight back of the wrist, have the curved fingers. So hopefully that helps. Um, so very good. All right. Um, as you have other questions, uh, drop them in the chat. Um, I had another question that uh, came in in advance was how to tackle a new piece rhythmically. And uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about uh, how do I approach a piece and I'll make the replay of this available. So if you didn't see the beginning where I talked about my approach for learning a new piece, you can go back and see that. But as far as how to learn something rhythmically, um, I like to vocalize the counting. And so, you know, one of the things I'll typically do when learning a rhythm that's um, something that I want to clarify in my mind is before I actually play it, I will vocalize it. So let's say I have a quarter, two eighth notes, a quarter, two eighth notes, uh, something like that. Then I might say like, ta, 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 and vocalize it either just on a new neutral syllable like ta, or I might count it, you know, like one, two, te, three, four, te. And you'll notice my right hand's conducting. A lot of times I'll conduct. So if I'm in four, one, two, three, four, you know, one, two, te, three, four, te. Or I might just tap the subdivision of the beat. One, two, te, three, four, te. So in other words, I am vocalizing the rhythm and I'm either tapping or conducting the beat uh, or even tapping the subdivision of the beat uh, so that I have a framework for clarifying it. Then once I've clarified it away from the guitar, then I would do it on the guitar, you know, ta, 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 ta. And if it's something that's complicated in pitch, you know, a lot of different notes, then I might even do it like I just did there on an open string. So let's say that the actual thing is going to be something like, And that's not complicated, but just saying like if the note changes uh, and in some pieces it might be something really complicated, then I might just do the open string rhythm first before doing the actual, you know, the actual rhythm from the piece. So that's how I would tackle something uh, rhythmically. Now, I see another question in the chat. If a brand new student appears to want to play his or her guitar as a left-handed player, do you try to change this person into a right-handed learner? Can this even be done? Well, one of the things to realize with this is there are a lot of great guitarists uh, who are naturally left-handed but play the guitar what we would think of as right-handed. In other words, they pluck the strings with their right hand and they're fretting uh, with their left hand. So just because someone is left-handed when they write doesn't mean they have to play the guitar um, you know, left-handed. And so that's the first thing to realize. You know, when you think of an instrument like the violin, most people don't restring the violin and start learning to bow with their left hand. They usually bow with their right hand, uh, regardless of whether they're left-handed or right-handed when it comes to writing. So I generally encourage students to learn the guitar this way with the right hand plucking, the left hand fretting. Uh, some of the guitarists I know who are left-handed who play in the traditional way will say, hey, the hardest part is what your left hand has to do. So if you're a left-handed person, and you are fretting the notes with your left hand, you have an advantage. You're actually doing the hard work with your dominant hand. Uh, so I think that's very valid. But if I have a student that really insists, like I must play left-handed, I really think that's the way for me, I want to have the guitar that way, I will let them do it. Um, but I, again, if it's a beginner like you're describing, I strongly encourage them to learn the traditional way. It's just so much easier to access uh, you know, pedagogical materials and method books and things like that if they're learning the traditional way. So I usually prefer that. If somebody's been playing left-handed already for a year or two, I just let them keep going. But um, again, if it's a beginner, I would strongly encourage them for all the reasons I just said to start learning the traditional way with the right hand as plucking. So good question. How do I become a better sight reader and is reading music hard? Well, one of the things I'd say about that is becoming a better sight reader, again, I would start away from the guitar. I was talking about rhythm a minute ago, counting the rhythm away from the guitar. I would do the same thing with notes. You know, if I'm trying to read notes off the staff, um, then let's say I have E, F, F, G, F, F. 
uh, I might actually say the letter names first if I'm a you know if I'm a beginner at note reading and even you know if I'm learning a new piece I'll use that as part of my process of learning a new piece I will say letter names of what I see on the page away from the guitar uh, because if you think about it there's multiple skills when you're note reading uh, there's the skill of actually recognizing the note on the page but there's also knowing where to put that note uh, on the guitar uh, so uh, when I'm again if I'm trying to uh, learn a new passage then I might say E, F, F, G, F, F away from the guitar, get clear in my mind what the letter names on the staff are, and then practice putting that on the guitar, E, F, F, G, F, F. And if you're trying to note read for the first time, you said, you know, is note reading hard? It can be a little tricky. You know, one of the things I talked about a little earlier was if you're trying to play higher up on the neck, um, you know, the notes higher on the neck, sometimes you find the same note in multiple places. You find an E on the first string and then that same E on the second string, that same E on the third string. And so that makes it a little confusing uh, reading notes on the guitar. Well, you know, which one should I play? And really it's the player's choice. You know, if you see an E notated in the top space of a treble clef, you can play that E in multiple different places. Um, so it can be a little tricky to note read. I really think it's worth it. You know, note reading is the universal language of music. And so as guitarists, when we don't read, we're kind of left out of that universal language. And also when we learn that universal language of note reading, we, we open up those choices to ourselves. Hey, I know this is an E, but I also know I can play that in different places on the neck. And that's really helpful. Now, I see some more questions in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna hit another question I got in advance, and I'm gonna hit this one really quick, uh, but I just thought it was an excellent question, so I wanna hit it really quick. Um, it deserves probably um, a huge long discussion, but I'll, I'll hit it quickly. But the person was asking about, if you're teaching guitar, how do you decide what to teach and what not to teach? In other words, there's so many possible topics you could cover. And even within classical guitar, there's a lot of topics you can cover. But what if you're also teaching rock guitar and folk guitar? You're trying to teach them to strum chords while they sing. You're trying to teach lead guitar and rhythm guitar. And maybe you want to teach them some flamenco. You know, how do you decide if you're only going to work with a student for a couple years, maybe four years? Um, you know, how do you decide what to teach them and what not to teach them? Well, I have a couple thoughts on this. One is I would say you want to think about um, first of all, teaching the student to learn for themselves. If you can help a student to become a self-directed learner, and that is you can help them to get to the stage where they can learn for themselves, then you're really teaching them how to fish. You're not just giving them a fish. You know, I feel like a lot of guitar teachers, it's kind of like give the man a fish. You know, I'm going to show you this one riff. And then the next lesson, hey, I'll show you another riff. But to me, I want to teach a student how to fish, so to speak, to use that old, that old saying. And so I'm going to want to explain to the student, here's how to learn. Here's how to understand the theory behind what you're doing. Here's how to know how to approach something else when you learn it. So if you're teaching a student just for a couple years, hopefully you give them enough tools of how to learn that they can learn things that you don't teach them. So that's the first thing I'd say on that. Second thing I would say is um, I find that teaching should be a give and take between the teacher and the student. Uh, so if you have a group of students and they all want to learn rock, well, I would probably teach them some rock, even if, you know, you think, hey, I really think they need to learn these things on classical. I would have a little give and take there. Um, and certainly, I think it's good to expose students to different types of skills. So when we think about what the guitar can do, you know, there's lead guitar, uh, sort of improv playing melodies and leads. There's rhythm guitar, strumming chords. There's bass guitar playing the bass line. And then there's kind of being the one man band and that's what classical or fingerstyle does. You can play the lead rhythm and bass all at the same time on the same guitar. And that's what I tell students, you know, if they're not excited about classical guitar, I'll say, you know, if you want to play lead rhythm and bass, hey, learn to play lead rhythm and bass all at the same time on the same guitar. And that's an excellent skill. Uh, so what I would say is expose students to different things, um, you know, expose them to lead, rhythm, bass, uh, expose them to classical finger style, maybe expose them to some flamenco and other styles, blues, etc. Um, but ultimately, as long as you teach them how to learn and you have that kind of give and take between what you want them to learn and things they want to learn, then I think you're going to be successful. And again, if they know how to learn on their own, they're going to go on and teach themselves more things on the guitar the rest of their lives. So that was an excellent question. I uh, really liked it. So I see other uh, great questions in the chat. Um, and so do you ever get a new student who does not care about performing in front of an audience but only wants to learn to play for his or her personal and private enjoyment? Um, and yes, yeah, certainly I've gotten students like that. And I used to approach this kind of heavy handed because um, I really believe that one of the purposes of music is sharing music with other people. And so, you know, we get sometimes a little bit, um, 
you know, almost mystical about performance, like, oh, performance, it's like this big deal. But really, if you think about it, performance is sharing music with others. Um, I use the analogy sometimes, it's like you find a seashell on the beach. If you find a really pretty seashell on the beach, your instinct is to show it to whoever you're with. You know, you're walking with your significant other or you're walking with a friend and you say, hey, I found this awesome seashell, check this out. Well, performance is kind of like that. It's sharing music with others. It's saying, hey, I found this beautiful piece of music. I'd really like to share this with you. And so that's something I would encourage anyone who makes music to do, to share music with others. And so, like I said, early on as a teacher, I was kind of like, all my students are gonna perform at one point or another because they need to have this experience of sharing music with others. Uh, but what I found is, especially with adult learners, you know, if somebody's 40 or 50 years old and they're picking up the guitar for the first time, sometimes it's a little intimidating to get up in front of people. And so I think, you know, if somebody just says, hey, I wanna learn guitar purely for my own enjoyment, I would say, have at it. And then I would certainly encourage someone to consider sharing music with others. And it doesn't have to be necessarily, hey, you're gonna be up on a stage in front of hundreds of people, but it could be, hey, maybe play at a retirement home for a few people there. You know, play for just some friends at the holidays, play for just your family or whatever. So I certainly encourage people to find a way to share music for others, but I don't think it has to be a dogmatic thing the way maybe I felt when I was a younger teacher, um, but uh, I do think it's valuable. Um, I, I just don't force it anymore. And uh, another question, or I, I don't know if this is really a question so much as a statement, I assume a lot of ear training is involved. Um, and so, you know, certainly I think that ear training is very useful. And so what is ear training? Ear training is really, uh, kind of recognizing intervals, recognizing chords and things like that by ear. Uh, there's a website I really like uh, called musictheory.net. And at musictheory.net, you can practice uh, ear training skills. You can practice recognizing intervals and recognizing scales and recognizing chords by ear. Uh, so I think going to musictheory.net and doing some of the exercises there is a great way to work on ear training. Um, also just playing by ear, you know, you hear a song and sometimes I'll do this, I'll hear a pop song on the radio, you know, Adele comes out with a new song or, you know, some other pop artist. And I'm just like, hey, I wonder if I can play the melody of that song. I wonder if I can play the chord progression. And I've been doing this long enough that I almost always can, you know, pick up that melody or chord progression or whatever. And so I will typically um, just, you know, do that as a ear training exercise. So I think just trying to play along with the chords or melody of a song you hear is great ear training. And then also doing some exercises like on musictheory.net is great for ear training above. Ah, Gord, I see you got to go shovel some snow. Uh, I don't have any snow where I am, but have fun with that and appreciate you uh, tuning in on the stream today. And I'm probably going to wrap up here in just a few minutes. Um, but I just want to ask, are there any more questions uh, before I go? If not, I may talk just uh, for a moment about kind of warming up and, uh, you know, exercises you can use for warming up. Uh, but any other uh, questions before I go? So I'll keep an eye out for questions, but I'm going to go ahead and just talk about a couple warm-up exercises. And I really like the uh, warming exercises in the Pumping Nylon Technique Handbook by Scott Tennant. Kind of a funny title. You know, he's making an analogy to pumping iron, you know, exercising. Uh, but he says pumping nylon because the nylon strings. And uh, so in his daily warm-up exercise, uh, he has these walking exercises where he walks across the string. And uh, yeah, I see uh, Skeet Joystick mentions the spider walk. And yeah, that's definitely a good one. I'm just going to kind of show the uh, pumping nylon uh, daily warm up. So again, this kind of left hand walking. So you just take the first finger and you go across all the strings. And when you do this, you try to stay on the fingertip um, and you try to keep it as legato as possible, avoid gaps in the sound as much as you can, which is hard to do. And then you do that with each of the fingers, then you do it with the second uh, finger. And then the third finger. And then the fourth finger. And then uh, Scott Tennant has this walking where he alternates fingers. So first finger on the sixth string, second finger on the fifth string, but still on the first fret. In other words, normally we have the second finger on the second fret. He has the second finger on the first fret and he walks the fingers across the first fret.
And I see the comment there, listening, uh, made you feel better about being a left-handed player who plays right-handed guitar. Good for you. Yeah, again, I think it's great. Uh, you have the dominant hand to do the hard stuff. Uh, so with that walking exercise, uh, you can do two, three then on the second fret. And then you can do three, four on the third fret. And then he has these uh, left hand independent exercises that I think are great, where you basically line up all four fingers on the third string. You don't actually play the third string. What you do is you take your first finger and you go from the fifth string first fret to the second, and then you're gonna go from the sixth string to the first. This is just a great workout for your left hand. So it's fifth string, second string, fifth string, second string, sixth, first, sixth, first, fifth, second, fifth, second, sixth, first, sixth, first and then you do that with each finger now you do it with your middle finger then you do it with your ring finger which is probably the hardest because the ring finger is not very independent from the other fingers naturally and then you do it with the pinky finger And so those are some of the exercises from Pumping Nylon Daily Warm-Up. There are others, and I encourage you, if you don't have the Pumping Nylon uh, Guitar Technique Handbook, that's a great book for just having some exercises to work out the hands uh, on the guitar.